Okay, so now that the United States is at war, just like in World War I, we need to have special agencies to coordinate the war effort so that way we can outproduce our enemies. And that's going to be one of the main reasons why we eventually are successful in World War II. You know, and that's something that we've really seen time and time again. What wins you a war? Part of it is longevity. If you're willing to keep fighting longer than the enemy and sacrifice more, you're typically going to be able to outlast them and win, especially in smaller struggles. Like the American Revolution was a relatively small war. We were able to eventually figure out a lot of our production shortcomings, the Patriots, but we mainly outlasted the English and then got a couple big victories. It's like how the, the Vietnamese beat the United States in the Vietnam War. They just outlasted us and they were able to have just enough supplies to get by. When you look at the Civil War, the North primarily won because they had more supplies, more men, and they could grind down the South. When you look at World War I, why did the Allies eventually beat the Central Powers? Because they had more supplies and they were able to outlast them. World War II, why did the Allies eventually win? Because we outproduce the Axis powers and the Axis powers aren't able to fulfill their supply shortcomings and we just grind them down right so we've got to get organized and coordinated so when it comes to industrial production there's going to be um, a, a couple big agencies and boards one is just simply called the war productions board so right away very early in 1942 January 1942 we create the war productions board it's established to manage industry the war productions board is going to uh, manage industry to be able to produce all of the things we need to be able to fight there's also another uh, organization called the office of war mobilization the Office of War Mobilization. This is going to be more specific and it's going to set production priorities and control raw materials. So this is going to say, you know, uh, right now we need uh, like priorities. It's going to say first we need tanks, then we need planes, then we need ships. First we need food, uh, then we need canned water, then we need whatever else. Okay, so that's like the priority system. And then it's going to control raw materials. They're going to control oil, you know, um, iron ore, steel, lumber, all that kind of stuff, you know, sugar, meat, so that way they can get everything coordinated together. Both these um, boards, the, the War Productions Board and the Office of War Mobilization, they use something called the cost plus system. This is something we're going to see in World War II, where the companies that are working for the government, they get paid the cost of their products plus a certain percentage for profit. And as a result, the economy boomed. War production cranked up very quickly. Millions of men are enlisting in the war, uh, and enlisting in the army and the armed services to be able to fight. And then you have other people that are getting pulled in to work. And the economy boomed as a result of the war production and pulled the U.S. out of the Depression once and for all. Things were so good that by 1944, there was virtually no unemployment. Unemployment was down to 1.2%, which is just absolutely heard of, unheard of. And our production was astonishing. Uh, we produced over twice of all of the acts of power. So when you look at all of what the U.S. produced... Just the U.S. alone produced more than twice the amount of goods that Germany, Italy, and Japan did combined. The assembly lines were pushing out products at an amazing clip. I mean, by the time we got humming, we could build a large-scale destroyer in 14 days in California. It destroys a type of naval ship that if you stood next to it, you'd be in awe at how big it is. I mean, it's like a cruise ship covered in guns, and we could make it in 14 days. So our production cranks up, people get to work, we get pulled out of the depression, and this is a huge factor for our success. Then another big aspect of life is regulations. Almost every aspect of American life was regulated to maximize economic production. And the group in charge of this was the Office of Price Administration, the OPA, the Office of Price Administration. They regulated the prices for goods, they regulated wages, they regulated rents, they rationed commodities like sugar, gas, and tires. If we were in class, I'd be able to show you. Um, one of my grandmas had some rations left at the end of the war. So I have her ration book. She had like some flour and some sugar and some oil left. And she had it in her ration book. And there'd be all kinds of things where people would be, you know, I'm um, swapping these things around. Hey, I'm not going to use my oil, but I need some flour and people would trade. Um, you know, rationing was the way of making sure that we could feed our soldiers, that we could feed the allies, and that there'd still be enough for everybody to, you know, kind of have something left over. And then you wouldn't see things off the shelves, right? And, and 
unfortunately, we all know that now in 2020, if that's when you're watching this video, we know how weird it is to go to the store and not see toilet paper or paper towels or cleaning supplies because there was no regulation of those materials, right? Um, now, I'm sure there'd be a lot of people that'd be upset if they were rationed, but it'd probably be make sure that everyone could, you know, get their fair share. So there were lots of regulations over every aspect of American life. Um, and as eventually, you know, we'll see there's going to be some freedoms that are taken away too. So that way we don't have as much freedom of speech and freedom of press as we did before. But again, it's, it's in an effort to win the war and an effort for mobilization. And people got behind this, you know, maybe some people whispered about that they didn't like it. But no one stood outside of their house and complained about the regulations, right? Especially because it's so much different when there's actually fighting going on. Because then you say, well, you know, if I need to sacrifice a little bit of sugar and oil and flour so that way the, the men on the front lines can win and be fed, you know, that's a totally different ballgame. All right, unions. Labor unions and large corporations made an agreement as long as the war lasted, there'd be no strikes. Um, eventually, there was some tension here. Workers became upset because their wages were frozen, but corporations were making some very large profits as they were supplying all these government contracts. But again, the agreement was made. We're just not going to strike at this time, so that way we can make sure that our mobilization is just kicking and we're producing as much as we can. When it came to finance, the government had to raise funds to finance the war and did so through a few different th means. One, they increased the income tax. For the first time in American history, most Americans were required to pay the income tax. Um, in 1944, the tax began to be directly taken from people's paychecks. After the war, we'll scale that back a little bit, but but eventually the income tax just becomes part of people's lives. The other big thing that the government did was selling war bonds. Now a bond is basically like you buy a bond. Okay, So let's say I buy a bond today from the US government for $100. I get to cash the bond in 12 months and it's worth $125. Right now that'd be a great return, a 25% return. Typically it's going to be like a 5-10% return. Right, So you buy a $100 war bond, you get $110. Right? And it's easy to do this during a war because there's not a lot of consumer products available. So people are willing to take some of the money that they're saving, put it into a bond, get a little bit of return on their investment because they're not going to be able to spend that money anyways because it's not like you can go down to like at this time, you couldn't go down to JCPenney's or Sears and buy a bunch of new clothes or go to the local Ford dealership and buy a new car because Ford was making tanks and planes because JC Pennies and Sears are making, you know, uniforms and boots for soldiers. There weren't a lot of consumer products out there, but there was a huge campaign for war bonds. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about propaganda in a moment. Right? I love this one. I'm making bombs and buying bonds. Buy victory bonds, right? Get out there, do your part, work, but then also buy these bonds, right? And here's here's another good one, right? Uh, doing all you can, brother, buy war bonds, right? The more bonds... Yeah. That one. You want to look at that one? Okay, hold on. Joey wants to look at this one. Which one? This one? Okay, Joey wants to look at this one in the corner. <laughs> this one says, protect his future, buy and keep war bonds. Do you like that one, buddy? <laughs> yeah. That one. You want to do this one next? Yeah. Okay. All right. This is a good one. little biblical reference. Deriv deliver us from evil. <laughs> Get Deliver us from the Nazis. <laughs> buy war bonds. Protect your kids. Yeah, bud. That one? Which one? That one. This one? Yeah. We already looked at that one, but do you want to look at it again? Yeah. Okay. Say, say, yeah, I want to look at that one. No, now you're going to be quiet. Okay, which one? This one? Okay. Yeah, we already looked at this one, buddy. It says, I'm making bombs and buying bonds. 